there are a lot of cloud-based database solutions out there, each tailored for a different purpose. Terso is a cloud-centric database that focuses on edge-based computing. They claim to bring the standardization and ease of use of SQLite to production-based distributed edge-located data management systems. Glauberg Gosta is the founder and CEO of, Ter of Terso, and he's my guest today. Glauber, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Lee, thank you so much for having me. So I'm glad you're here. I, I'm trying to figure out really what the essence is of your product, right? And so to me, what it seems like, it's you're talking about you know, a production quality SQLite, which is by itself a, an amazing feat, you know, um, but geographically distributed, small footprint for edge location focus. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that a good summary or what else would you throw into that? Uh, it's a, it's a pretty good summary, and and I think that uh, it all it's all it's always a challenge to talk about uh, anything really, especially in technology, because it depends on on like who is on the other side, who's listening, and what you care about. Uh, but, but but one thing that that I, that I always like to highlight is that look, SQLite is the database with the best developer experience in the world. Like uh, it, it's not even close. Every tutorial mm -hmm. starts with SQLite. When when it's you go, so like, simple uh, to it, use, it's so simple to use, right? Yeah. But the problem, the problem is that like uh, now I've done this tutorial, I've used SQLite, I created my app, right? Just uh, used the Prisma ORM or any other ORM. Now what? Like I need to take another step to go find the new database from each user. So one of the things that we want to do with Tor, so that goes beyond the the performance, the latency, the, the, the is really just like okay, so how does that on ramp works, right? Uh, can we provide this experience of a bit this this tool? Uh, and and I, I don't want to discount as well that SQLite is a great database they use for real use cases, but it's usually an embedded device where you don't need the connectivity anyway. Like as a Things local like an database. internal iPhone app. Like, it, lot, right. Yeah. So you, would, you wouldn't necessarily think about like if I'm using a web application, right? Usually the journey is like the tutorial is on SQLite, the getting started is on SQLite. How do we uh, how do we get your production uh, in 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 that database technology as well, which has other advantages way beyond like one of the things that we hear a lot is like testing databases is a pain, like of course it is. I mean CI, CI is obviously not anybody's idea of fun to begin with, and now you have to like you you're connecting to Postgres, you need to spawn a container or to test it locally or spawn Postgres in the CI. We had a product before. That, that had that and like there was always like some port conflict always some issue with tear down and then it takes forever and like SQLite is, is, is just the file so like this developer experience of like I, I started super simple but even after I'm going to production like I can now use it as a production web-based database and I can test those things locally with flat files spread those things around so this is sometimes to me way more important than any uh, you know number that you can attach to it in terms of performance cost or anything like that now for people who who use SQLite but don't really understand how it's you know, what some of its limitations are compared to other databases. SQLite doesn't really have a server mode, right? It, it's, it's a library that plugs in and uses flat files. There's no connection to a port or anything you need to make. But as a side effect of that, there's also no remote that goes along with that. Now, mm -hmm. now um, that gives a lot of limitations on what you're able to do with the database, but it's also what gives it a lot of its simplicity. Now you've you've extended that, right? You've you've right. moved beyond the basic SQLite, and um, and 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 uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit more about yeah. some of the extensions in, you've added? Yeah, in, in, in fact, the 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 thing that you described that SQLite doesn't have is exactly what we added, right? And and it's one it's one of the things that that we added. Uh, so j just for for clarity, uh, one what we've done. Uh, we, we had a, we had a goal which was to build the database with all of those characteristics that that you you, you read uh, from in the beginning the, the latency the geographical distribution edge friendly and and all of that we knew SQLite was was the perfect building block for it uh, and all we wanted to do was like let's make some changes to SQLite because SQLite is almost perfect for what we want to do right it, 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 almost uh, so we made a bunch of changes to that. Uh, SQLite, unfortunately, per their own admission, they, they are not an open contribution product, so they would not be interested in the contributions anyway. That, that's what they want to do. Uh, so we forked SQLite. So what, the, one of the things that we've done in the journey to create our product 
uh, was to have this fork of SQLite where we keep our changes, but we also welcome changes from anybody else. So we, we call it ourselves, uh, again, not, not the, the company product, but the specific project, the open contribution fork of SQLite. Uh, and the name of that project is LibSQL, right? So in LibSQL, we, which is again a purely open source project, uh, we, we, get, we, there were, uh, contributions for other people in the past that have nothing to do uh, it's a it's a relatively new project, but we had already some contributions from people that have nothing to do with our organization or what we want to do. But we also made changes uh, to that to allow SQLite to be used in a server environment, right? So and and without losing the ability of being an embedded database. So you can SQLite has a connection string for people who are familiar with that. Uh, so you can use this connection string as a file, and now you're talking to a file. Or you can pass an HTTP address, and now you're talking uh, to a server. So those are changes in, in the client. And then we also have, as part of that project, a server implementation, right? Uh, off that, off, if you're talking HTTP, you're talking to something, right? Just uh, So you have the server mode, the thing, and then you have the client that connects to this connection string, all part of this project. And Torso is a managed version of this, essentially. So now it's not only a server version that runs on your server as a separate process, it also can r run remotely over the internet and over here. Yeah. Privately. So if you're using Turso, for example, which is our managed service, like a, then you don't, the, the experience that the user is going to have is that you create a database, you can do this uh, from the CLI. So we have a CLI, it, again, SQLite being so nimble, uh, it creates you a new database in less than 10 seconds, uh, including all the provisioning, the, the VM that we're going to create for you, all of that. So in less than 10 seconds, uh, you, you create a, a database. Uh, now you have an HTTP connection string. That's it. You, you just connect to that. Uh, and if instead of passing this, uh, instead of passing this HTTP connection string, you pass a file connection string, now you're doing locally. Right. And, and one of the things that we just announced this week is, is, is a, is a much better way to go between those things in the same application. But the idea is like, let's do file, let's do HTTP and let's do everything in between. Uh, but, but not only file, right? So we're moving SQL, uh, the, the idea of SQLite, the concept of SQLite to a remote database as well. Okay. So now it's a remote database. Um, but you, you go a, a step beyond that as well too. And you actually create a, geographically distributed version of that database. That, that, that's right, yes. Why don't you talk about uh, that? So uh, it, it's, it's super interesting because uh, we, I, I have a, a talk next month coming up in a conference called P99 uh, in which I talk specifically about that. But uh, lots of people, like uh, when, when you're optimizing databases, right? So you, you, it's a lot of, uh, you put a lot of work to maybe optimize your, your latency from 30 milliseconds to 20 milliseconds, and then, wow, that, that, that's great, right? Uh, but the reality of the world is that the world, the speed of light limits what you can do. So if you are in Australia, and if you are accessing a database that is in, in the United States, I'm sorry, I mean, the, it's 200 milliseconds at least. Like the, the, it's impossible Very little, to do <laughs> almost right? nothing you can do to fix that problem. Uh, 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 right? Outside of recreating the universe with different <laughs> laws. I mean, there's very little you can do to solve that problem, right? So, so, uh, the only, and this hasn't traditionally been too much of a problem because you, you have things like, wow, you know, my, my, my back end is here very close to the database. Uh, but there is a problem with that. So there is, a, there is a trend in the industry, which is like, look, the back end being, being, close to the services is fine, but that doesn't change the fact that the user is, is, is far away. So you need to find a way to, to push the, the, the backend code close to your user. And then you have things like Cloudflare workers. The Cloudflare workers are essentially something created to solve this problem. Uh, and then you have Vercel Edge, Netlify Edge, and a lot of other web edge solutions. I will allow you to execute code close to the user. Fantastic. But then again, if you're just doing a URL transformation or you're doing super simple that doesn't require any state, that that is good. But the moment you have to access the database, you, you're, you're actually worse than before because with the backend close to the database, way. you have all the round trips. You, you have one big round trip from Australia to your your backend, and then you have a bunch of round trips between the, the database and, and the backend and the response back. Now with the edge, uh, your, your, your compute is now close to the user in Australia and all the round trips because the, be, between the backend and the database are now uh, essentially uh, making your experience worse. 
uh, you, you have to architecture things in a way to hide this problem. It gets everything a lot more complicated. So it's important for us to to make this thing geographically distributed. And and again, we we, we didn't start with with SQLite as because we we didn't start from the the solution. Hey, SQLite, what can we do with that? We started with the problem, right? So let, let's we want to solve the problem of edge compute, right? We, we, of a, data in edge, edge compute. Data. How how do we solve the problem of edge data? Okay, so the way to the only way to break this geographical this speed of light issue is replicating data, but try replicating uh, Postgres instance to thirty locations. You, you, you're gonna break the bank. It's it, it's it's extremely expensive. Uh, so when you think about it, it's it's really a problem of cost. It's not a problem of technology. The technology is there. Like replication exists for forever. Passive replication is good enough for a variety of use cases. Uh, the web runs on caches anyway. Uh, in, in, in a lot of ways. So it's really the fact that you can't economically put Postgres on that many locations or MySQL. I mean, I'm not picking on Postgres, of course, but like, a, or in, in, in any of those locations, plus the developer experience uh, on, on, on top of that. Because like now, if you have a lot of those replicas, you need to be very aware where are those replicas, where, which replica am I connecting to? Is, is this uh, in sync or not? Or, or, or all of those kinds of problems. So the experience we, we want people to have with Turso is the following. You go, you, as I described, you create a database. You, it, it's ready in a couple of seconds. And then you just select uh, which, where do you want your replicas. But your connection string doesn't change. You always, you always have a single connection string, which is the address of your database. And all the routing is done by us. So if uh, you don't have to change any configuration in your application, uh, you, again, you keep connecting. You you change. You develop on connect is pointing to a file, uh, and then you uh, you you give your HTTP URL to your uh, application, and you don't have let's say a replica in in Tokyo. Tomorrow you see you starting to have a bunch of users in Tokyo. You now go to the LibSQL the, to the Turso CLI. You create a replica in Tokyo, and people from Tokyo are going to be routed there. That that's it, right? Without any changes, uh, and. This has to make sense from from the cost point of view, as I said, which is why SQLite was the great uh, the, the the building block that we chose, because it fits everywhere. I mean, it's the database that has been traditionally running on mobile phones, and on my my watch probably has some SQLite on it. <laughs> so, like, if, if you can now make a database that's super cheap to run to the point that running uh, just just for comparison, our scalar plan on the website costs twenty nine dollars a month and includes six locations, right? So. Yeah, that's that's much cheaper than you can do for you know MySQL yeah. or Postgres or anything like that. But but now what what you end up with? Correct me if I'm wrong. Is you're when you create a cluster database using um use, using uh, uh, SQLite or, or you, using Terso, I guess is really the the mm -hmm. correct terminology. Now when you create a cluster database using Terso, let's say in six locations, one of those is still the primary, and the other five yes. are all replicas. That's right. And so are yes. they read-only replicas or are they read-write replicas? So uh, our, our technology is very interesting in that sense because, again, it doesn't quite – topology from, from the point of view of topology, like if you're talking from the point of view of the service, they are read-only replicas. Okay. But you can write to them. They're just going to route it to the primary. So it's not read-only in the sense that the user has to be aware and say, where do I write? Like Got you it. can so send HTTP requests to any of them. Uh, so in, well, in in New Jersey, you've got an interface for your application and you want to talk to the closest database. It'll talk to the replica to do the reads and then forward the writes on to yeah. wherever the primary is located. That, that's right. So, I mean, it, the application doesn't change, which I think it's it's the interesting thing of what we're doing. You can connect to any replica. As, it, because there is, in, in fact, with the single URL, you don't even know which replica you're you're connecting to. Like you just get right. that URL, but you can for for you know, obviously we we don't want to hide those kind of things. You can you have a command, a verbose version that shows you the individual URLs for each of the replicas. If you connect to one of them for whatever reason and you write to it, you you can still write. The only thing that you see from your point of view is that this write you have takes the longer, longer latency too. Yeah, the, exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it's it's still it's a synchronous write. If you do a synchronous write, yeah. it's a synchronous write to the database, and so you you have to still deal with the yeah. latency and, and this for write, the writes, uh, but not yeah. for the reads. And this write is not going to return to the writer until the write is is done 
on on the primary and back. So you have the right. region on right semantics, right? So uh, as long as long as you're connecting to the same replica, so from the point of view of one application connecting to that location, uh, you have this view of a consistent SQL database. Uh, that's uh, uh, but a other client that is connecting from another location and ends up on a different replica may see uh, uh, a snapshot in the past, right? So let's talk about consistency a little bit. So this is all great. I, I get now the architecture of, mm -hmm. of, of how it works. Is you have one primary, multiple replicas. If you write, you can read and write on the primary, obviously. On the replicas, yeah. if you read and write on those, writes are just forwarded synchronously to the mm -hmm. primary. So your performance characteristics on the replicas are very, very fast reads, and mm -hmm. the writes are still as if you talk direct, directly to the primary, but... That's, Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, that's how that things work. So now, given that, the consistency model is gen generically then uh, primary uh, with replicas consistency model, which is a, essentially an eventual consistency model. Is it, with, is it with, are you uh, truly eventual yeah. consistency, or do you have anything more in there to, to guarantee transactional um, integrity? Yeah, there is snapshot isolation, right? Because again, we never, uh, one of the changes that we've done to SQLite uh, in the LibSQL project was to uh, have a way to tap into the write-ahead log. So the way we replicate, uh, we always replicate a transaction boundary. So you're never going to see like, a, and again, I work uh, before, just for context on this, uh, before uh, Turso, uh, I was at Scylla, which is a fully like NoSQL eventual right, consistent right. database. Uh, and, and again, eventually that level of eventual consistency, which is like you never truly know the, the state of, of anything, like, and, and it, it's not what we have, right? So we have a stronger uh, guarantee than that. So it, it's snapshot isolation. If you do a transaction, you either, a replica either have the entire transaction or nothing at all. Right. So right? it's eventual so consistency at yeah. the transaction level. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. is called snapshot isolation, right? Snapshot so isolation. All, yeah. 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 So you always have you always have this those snapshots, right? Uh, but when 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 you think about it, like uh, when when you open a transaction uh, into a database like Postgres, like th that transaction will always see the state from when the transaction started. Like the database right. will change in in it, it may change in in other ways. That they, they, they you know if if it, there, if there is a conflict, the transaction fails. But other than that, I mean, you see the state where uh, as the transaction started. So it's about it's about the same thing. Like you, you, you replicate. We're replicating the entire transaction, uh, uh, so so you're always going to see that. Plus, you have, as I said, read your own writes. Uh, so if if you're writing from a specific location, then the write is only acknowledged when you're fully up to date. Right. So you, you, that means that in that in that same connection, you never see things going back in time, right? So you 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 offer then full transactional integrity. So if you That's do right, a, yeah. you, a transactions either succeed or fail and, and they're, they're always consistent that way. Yeah. So, um, um, let's, let's talk about that a little bit then. So, okay. Full transactional consistency. So, um, from the state of a client that's talking to one of the replicas and going through that model, um, the, in order to be transactional consistent, um, while you are processing the transaction, whoever it is that's creating the transaction and processing it, it does see the updates in real time. That's not, it's within the transaction. And so they can read and write values within the transaction yeah. that, um, and, and deal with that. Now in that case, that entire transaction has to go all the way to you're right. The, yes. The primary. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Even the, the reads have to come way, from the primary. Yeah, it's, exactly. It, and yeah. it, 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 there are two kinds of transactions, right? Uh, so what, there, there is batch transactions and interactive transactions. What you're describing is an interactive transaction. True. So an true. In, in, interactive transaction is exactly like, and, and, and it is a little bit of an anti pattern for, for, again, not only us, but any, any database that, that has, uh, I think, this kind of model. But, uh, you again, not that you can't do, but uh, it, it, if you can do batch transactions, is always better. And an interactive transaction is essentially uh, you open up the transaction, and and then the connection is there. <laughs> the connection is yeah. open. Now you can do whatever you want. You can read. You can write. You can run some code in the middle. Uh, again, this is a little bit more of an anti pattern, in, in in fact, to us because SQLite, uh, and this is one of the things uh, SQLite is infamously famous for only allows one writer. 
Right, so uh, the, the Postgres lock is uh, essentially, I don't know exactly the full granularity, but it's pretty granular. I don't know if it's at the B3 page level or at the row level, but but you can you, you don't lock the entire database to write. You really try mm -hmm. to lock only what you need. SQLite kind of locks everything. So you're not gonna, you, you can't have two transactions at the same time. So you can do interactive transactions, but the moment you have like multiple clients doing this, uh, which is where like, if you have a situation like that, what we recommend is like split this in different databases. Uh, and again, our free plan uh, allows you to create 500 databases. So you can do like, per, it's very good for things like per user data and et cetera. So fine, because now your transactions are isolated at, at, at the database level. But within the same database, you, you try not to like uh, do a lot, lots of interactive transactions. Batch transactions is something like you essentially do a begin, uh, and then you send a bunch of statements. Bunch of write and, statements or uh, read, sense. write, whatever you want, but and yeah. commit or roll back or etc. But there's no interactivity in the middle, right? So those are those are fantastic because that those you you essentially uh, you send it to the primary in in one uh, in 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 one uh, request. You do all the requests and and you return it back, right? So in you know to bring this down to to a, from a programmer to a programmer model so that we can talk about think about this a little bit in an interactive transaction if you start the transaction and you do reads and writes through it if you write a value and you read it you get the new value right away that's that's mm -hmm. within the transaction it, itself mm -hmm. now outside of the transaction you you either you don't see it until the transaction is committed but within the transaction right. you see it right away with a batch transaction if you're reading and writing as you're going along, all your reads are are getting data from the beginning of the transaction. They're not taking into account no, any of the writes uh, that are going on during there. No, no, not really. Uh, it's, and, and I can give you an example. So uh, let, let's imagine that you have uh, uh, the, the the interact transaction. Really, the, the pattern there is that you have some logic with those with those reads, right? So you need to do some logic. That's why it's interactive. You need to make a decision. You need to branch something. Let's say you have a counter of a user accesses or whatever score. So you you write to the transaction. Uh, you you right. you update that counter, and then you read after that. But then you write something else. Right. That 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 value still saw the update, right? Uh, uh, it's, so again, you That's wrote right. to the, the user read counter. has to have yeah. known about the previous write. Yeah, and exactly. Had the result so of the previous write. When, when, when you do yes. when you do a batch transaction, maybe your request that you're doing to the batch transaction is like it's exactly this. Like, give me. Uh, I, I want you to update the counter and give me the new value, and at the same time update the user with the counter information. Right. So you're doing all right. of those things in a transaction. Your reads see the new values in the transaction like any other transaction. What you can't do in a batch transaction is things like, oh, uh, test this and branch it. And then depending on, on this and that, uh, you can just start procedures and things like that. But like a, uh, the, the, the goal of an inter interactive transaction oh. is like open a connection, right? Read, yeah, I, write, I see what, it, how you're describing logic, that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. So you're, you're, you're putting the entire batch transaction into a, into a single non-logic um, flow, flow model in order to make that. Yeah, you, yeah you're, you're going to send us. Right. But I, I think I was, what I was trying to get to is if you did a random read from within a batch while you're creating a batch transaction, if your code just happens to do that, you're going to get a read as if you're not in the transaction. Yeah, I, th I think because, the issue there is like, what do you mean by part within of that the, transactional yeah. integrity that's going on there. I, so that you would still get that at a higher speed from the, the yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I think I think I know what you mean. Like what what threw me off is that your use of uh, within the transaction. Like, I agree. Uh, if, that right, was, that like, was a little. But, it was confusing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, but like if you do if you do another read outside of this transaction while this transaction is going on, sure you you see the the old value. Yeah. We should have a whiteboard here, yeah. and I think yeah. it <laughs> make, <laughs> totally. make it a lot lot clearer. So that that yeah. makes perfect sense. That, that that's great. Um, so let's see. So eventual consistency. Um. So how do you deal with data scaling? So the, one of the other shortcomings of SQL Lite is it's really designed for small data sets. Now, small data sets still could be, you know, megabytes or even gigabytes, but it's not designed for, you know, for SaaS application level scaling of data, you know, where you're talking about terabytes and petabytes of data. Uh, how do you deal with 
application scaling to larger and larger data sets um, and um, running into those sorts of limitations. Yeah. So I will I will question uh, it, this assumption a little bit because uh, like <laughs> I don't I don't see like I don't think there's a lot of SaaS applications out there at the petabyte scale. Fair e enough. And even, uh, it, that's yeah, fine. And, that's fine. That, that, and, that's and fair even, enough. But like one of the realizations that I had when I left Scylla, which was one of the things that led me to to uh, create or so was that, look, data people, and I've been part of the data industry for a long time, we're always talking about like a scaling and, and, and web and, and et cetera. Web scale, web scale was the term that, that generated all this, right? Yeah. So it, you think, you, 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 you always go to like, okay, will I get you the petabytes? And you have those, when, you, when you're trying to sell a big data solution, uh, every company has this slide. It comes, Gartner has it, and then and, and everybody also repeats it, where data is growing exponentially, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so like, uh, data is growing exponentially and aggregate. That's my thesis, right? But when when you remove, uh, and I talked to Alex Debris the other day, had a, a zinger on, on that one. Like, uh, if you remove everything that has a timestamp on it from this equation, like, so what 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 kind of things have timestamps on? Like m events, machine generated data, like time series data, like data that is generated by uh, by, by 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 equipments. If you remove that from the equation, data is not growing exponentially. Uh, I'm sorry, like I don't know how big your e-commerce is. Your product catalog does not have a terabyte of data. Like it does, it does not. Right. So just the. I, I, I agree, but an application yeah. is more than its catalog, right. and so sure. you know, yeah. if you look at, you know, I, look from my history standpoint, I came from Amazon and I came mm -hmm. from uh, New Relic, and both of those. Um, you know, la timestamp labeled data was very critical for, for both of them in very, very important ways. So you're right. The, in the case yeah, of like those, an e-commerce store, those, yeah. the catalog won't change in size. Exactly. But the transaction records obviously do and the event mm -hmm. records and, the, and, you know, and yeah. all of those, the analysis and, and, and all, sure. all of that does change. Are, are you saying that you don't recommend using uh, yeah. a Terso for that data? Sh yeah, pretty much. Like uh, again, d d depend depends on your size because there's also like a, there's also something about like the life cycle uh, of of the application, which is something like people talk about it on Twitter uh, the whole time. Like lots of the vast majority of SaaS are also not Amazon, right? Uh, and then the question is like, if you go for an architecture to handle Amazon scale from day one, you're probably spending so much time and resources to to get to this architecture. That it, somebody actually asked me this day this this very question on the Turso Discord. Uh, I have I have an I, I have an e-commerce site etc. Same characteristics as as Amazon. Can I build this with Turso? I said, look, when you get to the size of Amazon, probably not, or actually yes, yeah. cer certainly certainly not, right? But the first the first three years of of your of of that 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 workload, yes, you can. And then the advantage of that is that it's gonna in, in, you have three years to make it. It's gonna be fast. It's going to be simple to get started, uh, and and when you when you cross the hundreds of gigabytes threshold or to a terabyte, probably is when you think uh, that 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 maybe get out of the platform. But here's the thing: time series data will get you to that level in two months, right. uh, and the other data will get you to that level in in years, right? So 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 the question is like a. Uh, there is a point. We, we don't want to misrepresent the solution. Like there is a point at which Turso is just probably not the right solution for you. The claim that I have here is that like there is a there is a very big amount of applications, right? E even within verticals that can get big, uh, that just aren't that big. Uh, so, so absolutely right. And so your 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 claim is there's a large set of customers that can be served by smaller. Smaller, speaking, smaller databases. Yeah, e even e even in SaaS, right? If, even in, even in, in and by the way, we're not the only company uh, that got to this realization. Another company that I incredibly admire uh, is DuckDB, right? Uh, mother, like they they came from the same realization in the analytics uh, space. It's essentially, like there is a lot of workloads for which you essentially download uh, the your data and you do your analytics locally. Because it's a couple of gigabytes, and download. If, if I told you in two thousand and six, download a couple of gigabytes, you would have killed me. Right, but if I tell but you now, enough. download a couple of gigabytes, so boom, right? So just that—that's the the, the thing. What changed? I'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yep. No, I, I completely get it. And, and you're right about the size. It's, you know, I, 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 obviously from my history and what I advocate, you know, I, I've, one of my, the books I wrote is architecting for scale. I talk in, yeah. about scaling an awful lot. Um, is that you, you do want to think about scaling from the beginning, but you are right you that go. for a lot of applications, even if you think about scaling from the beginning, you never get to the point where you're more than a few hundred gigabytes or, or mm -hmm. probably maybe even less than that from a data standpoint. And so that makes your arguments make perfect sense there, but it is, it is a, an acknowledgement and you, you agree with this, that, um, you're, you really are designed for the smaller because it's of the SQLite framework, you're designed for smaller data sets than sure, what like yeah. a Postgres or a SQL server or large application. That makes makes perfect sense. Let's talk though about uh, scaling from the standpoint of of number of simultaneous clients making use of your database, and mm -hmm. we'll extend this conversation since you're a distributed database to number of nodes and mm -hmm. you know the, and how it works. What's a rational sort of upper limit of an application as far as number of simultaneous accesses. And we're, we'll stick to reads now because we understand the limitations yeah. of rights from what you were talking about. Reads only. How many active connections can you have into a single instance and how many instances can you really realistically get to? Yeah. The, again, the, the interesting thing about this architecture, uh, I don't think I, so the, the short answer is that I don't think I have a number so because I don't have a number, I'll ref uh, we'll, we'll try an explanation. <laughs> Just, if, you're, if your audience is mostly technical, and, and, but, but, and then maybe the reason I don't have a number, it will become more clear because this is something that the databases uh, fixate a lot with. I mean, this is how many, uh, right. like, to some extent, architecturally speaking, uh, our server mode is more like a web server with SQLite embedded than a database. Mm -hmm if you think about it, right? So, uh, and you, can, you have to keep in mind that it's designed to work well, uh, at, at least before this week where we announced Embedded Replicas. I mean, Embedded Replicas changed the game uh, a lot, but uh, it's been designed from the beginning to work with platforms like Cloudflare Workers, uh, Vercel Edge, and other Edge platforms. And those platforms are very limited in what they can do. Uh, I actually do not know that before I started digging into this, but uh, you can't usually do TCP connections from those platforms. All you have is uh, the node implementation of Fetch. Right? So you can do HTTP, nothing else. Cloudflare is announcing now TCP from their workers. It's still in beta. It's, you know, it's going to take some time to mature. The current situation is that it's all HTTP. So uh, what databases have been doing to serve this market is essentially that they are adding an HTTP proxy to their existing databases. And what we have done is a little bit different. It's like, let's write a web server, right? Uh, that has SQLite on it. And then we'll, we'll figure out a way to get the data distributed. That is what it is. So, so you don't send a select statement. You send a, here's a, here's a web page that's asking you to do a select or a HTTP. Yeah, it's a REST, request. it's, 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 a, it's, a it's, it's something like a REST API in a sense, right? So you, send an H, so you send an HTTP request, right? And in that HTTP request somewhere, there is all the information you need to process, the, the, including the select statement. And the return of that is like the number of rows and, and, and the columns and, 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 and et cetera, and, and all the- And then the data itself, yeah. So, First of all, this is yet another reason why this is so much better. And, and we, although we implement, we implement interactive transactions on top of that with a protocol, but uh, this is yet another reason why batch makes a lot more sense uh, because for this kind of data that I send a request and get all the information that I need back. But it, it doesn't, you don't keep connections open, right? So, so it, there is a limit of concurrent connections, but for web servers, this tends to be really, really, really high to the point that we don't we don't even care like uh and and also being a geographically distributed database the more locations you have right uh you're effectively increasing that limit because you now have more entities that you can connect to right true but they're you know if, if you look first of all at moving towards uh, protocols like http 2.0, which does mm -hmm. keep connections open, mm -hmm. um, you know, for performance reasons and performance of databases yeah. is extremely important. Um, uh, you know, then the number of op uh, simultaneous connections does become an issue. Yeah. And, and you're right. You can always add more replicas, 
But there's even limits to that because yeah. of the eventual consistency. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Forth, so. Well, but my point my point is that the number doesn't matter. My point is that usually databases, uh, especially SQL databases, count connections in the dozens, right? And and a web server will usually be counting connections in the thousands and, and, thousands, and the many thousands, yeah. right? So it's just because we are, after all, like we yes, it's a web server, but that is a database. Like it's just usually not something that comes up a lot. Uh, and and what you have is really just those HTTP requests. Right? Okay, so there's there's no fundamental um, architectural known yeah. limitations to the number of connections. It's yeah. So um, Postgres, for example, when you create a it, connection, it's, it, with, it's yeah. rationally high. It's rationally yeah. high. Yeah. When you create a connection with Postgres, you have to fork the server and then create a new process, and then, and there's all of that. Like a and when you create are a much con- heavier there. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. And, and a connection with us is is, is really like uh, it's, it's an HTTP connection. Then you open the connection, uh, and there's a SQLite embedded database in that connection. Right? There's not even a thread. It's essentially just an async event loop server. Right. Right, right. Yeah, your your limitations become more like the number yeah. of open files on the file system, and then on pretty much, else. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Number of connections on the server, you know, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, and and again, that's all very distributable as well. And so and, and just to make it uh, in case it's not obvious, uh, uh, it, it may not obvious uh, at least you start to think about it. If you had to connect to a central location so that we route you to the closest replica, you already lost the latency game, right? Oh, right. Uh, so, so we use DNS uh, in, 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 in that uh, single URL so that you, you will be connected to the closest replica directly. And in that sense that I'm saying, like, uh, the, the, the more you, you add replicas, because the connection happens directly to the replica, you are, like, you, you're not adding load uh, the, the only load that you're adding by adding the replicas is, is obviously on the primary, which is beef here to uh, essentially uh, pass on the, the replication. Like, so there is like uh, the number we work with for number of replicas is around 30, which is the number of locations that we support. Uh, so you can have those 30 replicas. The load that you generate by adding the replicas is just the replication itself. Like now you have more replicas, right. you have more load to, to replicate. Makes sense. And and to be clear to everyone, we're talking read only applications at this point it's writing in such yeah, a they, whole different level of uh, scalability yeah. just for completion for the topic do you have any thoughts on the maximum number of of writer processes that is reasonable to your application um i know you can only have one transaction going on at a time and so mm-hmm. they're very much se- uh, serialized so that that basically says a very tiny number of writers at a time yeah is that correct? V- very okay. tiny i mean just a v- very tiny because what happens is is that like a uh, it's essentially, so look, our, we, we've done benchmarks in which we do like a thousand to thousand writes a second, uh, which is pretty, pretty decent still. Yeah, uh, but they're, but they're not like the, the heavy interactive transaction rights. Like you, yeah. you can still, uh, because again, each write, once you, once you arrive at the server, SQLite will, will lock the, the database to write. But the write itself at that level is still at the microseconds, right? right. So, like once you are at the right instance, the in in our server, you still write in microseconds. Right. So, so, so like a, it, a significant portion of the write time yeah. actually is asynchronous. It is asynchronous. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like so. So the 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 the, the hard part is getting into, into the, the, the the expensive part. Is getting proxy to, to the right place. So again, if you open right. an interactive transaction, this dominates. But if you're doing like uh, updates, uh, update statements, and on conflict, whatever, however complicated your your uh, your update statement is, the the actual physical right is still very cheap. So you can, you can get you like thousands of of, of rights uh, easily. Sounds good. Great, great. Well, let's change gears a little bit and talk a little bit about near edge versus far edge. And mm-hmm. and to, just so people understand the terminology that I'm using here, and I think this is consistent with your terminology. When I think of near edge, I'm thinking of things like CDNs, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, they're they're um, uh, mechanisms that are tightly connected with the internet, but prov- provide data closer to where you're located. And then there's what's called the far edge, which is basically like your mobile phone is part of the far edge, right? You're, it's a device that's very, very hyper located near somebody, but has potentially less 
connectivity into the internet, either less reliable, mm-hmm. slower, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So either um, an edge location is either tightly connected to the internet, improving performance, or it's tightly connected to the user with questionable performance to the internet mm-hmm. itself. So given that distinction, how does your app fit into e- both near edge sorts of scenarios like CDNs and far edge solutions like mobile phones? So first of all, I just want to commend you on that because that was a fantastic summary of the landscape. Oh, thank you. And usually, usually the whole edge thing gets super complicated. A lot of people are like, what is the edge anyway? I mean, edge can mean anything and et cetera. Right. And, and, and for me, I, I, we wrote a bunch of articles about that uh, as well. Like for me, the defining characteristic is the connectivity. Like the, the near edge is connected and the far edge is disconnected, right? Just uh, right. so when, when we talk about, because uh, there, there is some, some confusion that comes from some way people use the terminology that is above that and extra to that. Uh, but Cloudflare workers, for example, is the near edge. Right. right. So uh, as as I mentioned, like we actually uh, uh, in the middle of uh, of releasing a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of new features uh, that this week, and the initial iteration uh, of our product was essentially only focused on the near edge. So as I mentioned, it was designed to work uh, with uh, with HTTP only. So we designed this from the beginning. Uh, and not this. This is not good for the far edge as well because HTTP like it or not, just works, uh, everything supports HTTP these days, right? Um, and and most of those platforms, are like Cloudflare Workers, are also serverless, so you don't have a file system. Uh, so the idea is, like, even if I could replicate the data, uh, even if I, it, it, they have nowhere to host it, <laughs> the, the idea yeah. is, like, a, it, it's it's essentially a CDN, as, as you described. Like it's, a, it's a CDN that executes code. That's what the, the, the near edge is, is, is becoming these days, right? Uh, so... Again, you, you connect over HTTP, you do your stuff, uh, and, and you select the Turso locations that you want to uh, have your replicas on, and, and there you go. That's it. Uh, one of the things that we added now, and which goes a lot more into the roots of, of, of SQLite, is what we call embedded replicas. So embedded replicas allow you to replicate the database locally if you have a file system. Uh, and it's a little bit different than other technologies that try to do the same in Sync SQLite, in which your writes are still always going over the network to Turso. So if you if you are disconnected, you can't write. That's the limitation. It, and again, it's a different other solutions that are based on CRDTs and local first. They're trying to tackle the problem of can I always write uh, and then merge those things later. Uh, we, again, we're focusing on simpler uh, applications in that sense. If you disconnect it, you can't write. Okay. But if but you can still read, I give you the same transactional uh, guarantees, and your reads are at the microsecond level. Right? So you can think of it as essentially like this this the SQLite uh, database that in the truer truest spirit of that that allows you microsecond level reads, but it's always in, synchronized with any other replica that you may have, right? Right. Yeah, I think of the hundred or so SQLite databases that are on my iPhone right now and imagining them all having synchronized backends and how useful yeah, that pretty, would be to pretty much, yeah. consistent data on my device. With, right with, with the caveat, like that unlike the CRDT-based solutions, that you have to be connected to write. Right, that's but, correct. Yeah. Right, but, but, but same same guarantees, like once you write, the write will bring the, 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 the new data in and you're going to have all this transactionality. Uh, but you can read in, in microseconds. And this is good for two things. First of all, it's good for the latency aficionados. And, and I'm definitely one of them because now I can really read my database in microseconds as long as I have a <laughs> file system. But also for uh, a little bit more into the far edge case in which my connectivity is existent, but not constant, right? It's just... Um, yeah, you're, you're trading off simplicity for uh, a simplicity of creation and simplicity of the data consistency model for, you know, uh, losing yeah. a feature that may or may not be important to you. So if you don't need that feature rights on mm-hmm. when disconnected, yeah. you can get a much simpler data model. That's much more consistent yeah. than and, some and of these being, other again, solutions that involve merging and all that sort of yeah. stuff. Be, being, being a managed service, like uh, this data is backed up for you. Like uh, you, you can, you can, you can have a hybrid model. So you can have a, the same database 
that is accessible. Over, you don't have to choose between one model or, or the other. You can connect it over HTTP from your Cloudflare workers. Uh, but then you put a copy of this on, on, on your server in Kubernetes or whatever you want and or, 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 or your phone or whatever have you. And now you can do local reads from that thing. So like uh, you, you could replace your cache. There are a variety, uh, there are a variety of, of workloads that are not at the far edge. Right, so it's, this is not right, a right. far edge only uh, solution, but right. it also allows you to get to the far edge. Right? Yeah, for for less far near yeah. um, uh, databases, it's it's still a performance improvement technology. Mm -hmm. It's just a yeah, that makes perfect sense. So um, you've mentioned a couple times a new product that's that's coming out, a new product feature set, I should yeah. say that that's coming out. Do you want to clarify a little bit more exactly what that is for our listeners? Yeah, so uh, we we have a uh, we have a launch weekend. If you go to blog .tech, you're going to see like we're going to be publishing uh, stuff every day uh, with with the with the details. Uh, the, some articles already, of course, are, are already out there. Uh, but I would focus just in the interest of time on the on the two biggest uh, uh, features that we had. Uh, we just discussed one of them, which is which is embedded replicas. Right? So embedded replicas will essentially allow you to replicate your database, and we're going to keep the synchronization. We're going to keep the rights. We're going to keep every everything in sync. Uh, so, but your reads like SQLite level reads in the microseconds, and you put this everywhere you want, uh, as as we discuss. The other the other biggest feature is that uh, uh, we are upping our the limits uh, uh, of of our of our plans, uh, and just so you can have an understanding of of how radical that is. Up until last week, we allowed a free user to create three databases. So you could go on through. So like a, because again, it's a free user, you're getting started. Uh, and, and then like a, you create a database to play with or maybe a simple production application for your until you re, is, is my application really going to scale or not, right? Uh, and we're upping that limit to 500 databases. So you can now create wow. for free 500 databases. And, and the scalar plan, which is our plan that costs $29 a month to get started, the previous limit was six databases. Now the new limit is 10,000 databases. Right, so you can create ten thousand databases uh, with that uh, uh, with with the same allowance, and again, this is a, 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 let me know how technical <laughs> you want me to get. But uh, the the reason for that is that like uh, the reason we can offer this. Let, let me first talk about like the who, who would need something like this. There are lots of people uh, that have per user data, like data that you want to mm -hmm. keep isolated one way or another, right? Uh, and and you may have a variety of reasons for that. One of them could be compliance because uh, let's say maybe you want you have this ten thousand databases. You you want to create five thousand in the United States and five thousand in Europe. Again, still replicated, but never outside of Europe because they have regulations about that. Uh, or maybe you have a user base that is like as I have some customers in Europe. I, I have some customers in the United States. I don't have to replicate all the data everywhere. Then you can put like some databases here, some databases there. Uh, so this this is the why we're doing this feature for essentially allow data isolation. Uh, and 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 data compliance, right? So uh, people have been asking this of us from the beginning, like ever since we let, we launched the first version of Turso. Um, we had many people asking us in our various channels and, and communities, look, if you guys are based on SQLite, why can't I create, like and SQLite is just a file. Why can't I create 10,000 files? And each file is one of my users, right? Mm. Uh, and, 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 and we couldn't really, because in our managed service model, uh, each database was essentially a VM, a VM with few resources, etc. But 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 a VM, uh, and even if you would run our open source server, you're still running like a server process per database, so it, it limits the amount of things that we can do. Uh, what we've done with this release is that we made our server multi-tenant, right? So in our server, you can now have different URLs, different files, everything isolated, everything separated. Uh, but now you're running a single server, and that server you have 10,000 SQLite files, uh, each of them with their own URL, each of them with which their own connection string. But you can now have this massive amount of databases as well. Neat. Yeah, that's. I I definitely see that use case. You definitely see people who just don't want to deal with multi-tenancy. You know, they'd much rather have a single tenant database. And yeah, SQLite is perfect for that, and perfect, your product yeah. would fit that perfectly as long as you can create 
lots and lots of databases. So yeah, that exactly. is, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah, 10,000 so, uh, and go, going back to, to that discussion about Amazon, et cetera, Amazon probably has a lot more than 10,000 customers. Uh, <laughs> but like uh, your, your, and it's not that 10,000 is the hard cap, but we, we always have enterprise plans where you can get more than that. Like we could easily get this number uh, to hundreds of thousands, right? But like a, uh, you, you can stay with an architecture like this uh, with Turso, again, super simple. And uh, by the way, another added advantage is that once you create the first database, that I, I said before, the creating a database takes seven seconds. But now, seven to 10 seconds. But once you create the first database, the next one is essentially free. It, it creates free. instantly, <laughs> right? Just uh, in less than, it's, it's in milliseconds. Uh, so you can easily create those databases and destroy those databases uh, within an API. Turso is all API based as well. So you can have an API in your SaaS that like, hey, a new user came up, create a new database. Uh, now they have a database. That, that's it, right? Just uh, And all their data is in, is in the database. Cool, cool. Yeah. Oh, that's great. We're, we're kind of running out of time here, unfortunately. I wanted to talk about how your company is structured and some of those things. I, we're going to have to save that for another uh conversation. I'd, I'd love, you know, just to kind of uh, uh, hint to people, um, you use a term called collaboratively transparent. I love that term. But yeah. let's save that. We'll talk about it at, uh, another time. If you're interested in what he's talking about with that, he's got a lot, of, uh, there's a lot of information on the Turo website that talks about it. So yeah, I would invite people to go take a look at that. They have an interesting company structure that's that part of the best way best way to describe it um but i like, like to end with something a little bit lighter you mm -hmm. your mascot is uh I iku is that how it's pronounced I I iku yeah iku iku can yeah. you can you tell me the story of iku uh so it's also the story it's so tightly connected with the story of this company uh, so uh, we had a previous product that, that didn't quite work. I was also uh, using lots of things just around SQLite and, and et cetera and, and trying to to reach the same audience. But like, as with many startups, uh, including my previous startup, Scylla, uh, I wasn't the founder, but I was one of the early employees. Sometimes startups change direction, right? Uh, and this happened to us as well. And when we were, we were kind of in the process of like, what is it that we should do? And, and we decided like a... Hey, maybe it's, it's this thing, right? The, the SQLite database the, with the same characteristics that we had today, but we did not know how to call it. Uh, and, and then my daughter was born prematurely. Uh, and then I had to rush to, and she had, obviously, as with a lot of uh, premature babies, there were a variety of complications. And I, I essentially disappeared uh, from the company for a whole month. Uh, and my co founder uh, stayed essentially running the whole thing. And he's from Finland, right? So there were two things that when I came back, there were two things that, that had happened that I, I had no, absolutely no voice with. Uh, first of all, he had written the entire backend in Go and I almost killed him because like everything else that we were doing, it was done in Rust. And it's like, now I have two languages to do with, which actually I, I ended up later recognizing was the right choice. The, you know, the, the benefits, I'm not going to the language framework here, but like the benefits of doing that uh, outweighed the, 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 the disadvantages of having to deal with, with, with two languages by, by a wide margin. Uh, and he had named the, the, the project. Like just the repository, just to get repositories, like he didn't propose this as an as an official name, uh, Iku Turso. Iku Turso, uh, and I'm trying my best to nail the pronunciation here. Uh, Iku Turso is a Finnish mythological creature. So you can you can Google it. It's a monster. Like a, I think it's similar to to Leviathan in in our mythology, oh, uh, yeah. but it's like it's a, it's this Finnish mythological monster that is also a Finnish beer brand based on the monster, right? So <laughs> we we couldn't so was come it named up with, after the monster or the beer. That's the real question. I think it's the beer. <laughs> we we couldn't agree on the name before I left to the hospital, and then he had to name the repository something, and then he named it Iku Turso because I think I, I think he was. Was actually drinking an Ikuturso beer. Just let me name this Ikuturso. Uh, that was a joke. And then we were like, okay, now we have to find a name for it. And naming things, as you know, is one of the two hardest problems in computer science, together with caching validation and off by one errors. Uh, and we couldn't, <laughs> we, we couldn't find a, but we couldn't find a better name. And this, this was growing on us. And, and we were liking Ikuturso, Ikuturso, it was a great name. Uh, Ikuturso, I think it would have been a bad product name. But then what we did is that we named the, the company and, and the product Turso, or Turso as, as we say in, in English, right? And then Eco became the mascot. 
And so yeah. just the Eco Turso as as it was the the code name, just a half mascot, half product. Cool. That that's great. Yeah. I, I I had not heard the story, but I knew yeah. I had been I knew it was an interesting story. So that's yeah. that that's great. Well, well thank you very much. Uh, uh, Glauber Costa is the founder and CEO of Turso, a cloud centric edge based computing platform, and he's been my guest today. Uh, uh, Glauber, thank you very much for joining me on Software Engineering Daily. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.